Good morning, everybody. It's so good to be together. Would you stand up with us? We're going to sing this morning the declarations of our faith in the name of Jesus. Put our hands together.
I love that line that's in that song. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. There's something that happens when we remind ourselves and recognize the reality of heaven, it changes what happens here. When we recognize that right now, God is being exalted. He is being worshiped in heaven because he's worthy of our praise. And as a result, when we attune our eyes and our heart to that, it changes our reality here. I remember what Jesus says when he's teaching the disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we submit ourselves, when we 
humbly recognize what God is already doing and the reality of who he is, his will is done in heaven and on earth and things change. So as we sing, as we worship, as we give our attention to God, remember that the reality of heaven is breaking into this place when we recognize who God is. And the same thing happens when we respond in our offering. We respond in our worship and, and our giving back of a sacrifice of the resources we've been given. We recognize the reality of heaven is God's in charge. It's all God's to begin with, and he gives it to us, and now we get the chance to give back to him. And when we do those things and give our attention to him and respond with our offering of sacrifice, his will is done. In the same way it's reality in heaven, it is accomplished here on earth. So there's lots of different ways to give on the screen or the seat backs in front of you, whatever it may be. But as we continue to do that, would we remember that when we do that, we're acknowledging the reality that's already true in heaven and seeing God's glory fill this place because he deserves it and he's worthy of our praise. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that the reality of heaven is not just kept in heaven. That God, it, it's breaking into our hearts and into the reality of our lives because you're a God that wants to be with us. You're a God that shows up when we come to you. So Father, as we respond now, giving back our resources of our time and our talent, our treasure, Lord, we do that because you, like we just sang, are worthy of our praise and you deserve it. So Father, continue to shape us, continue to form us and make us into the people that you desire us to be as we continue our service. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen.
God, we glorify you, we honor you. There is no powerful name like yours, Jesus. We celebrate that, we love you, we pray these things in your name, amen. Well, good morning, church. Let's turn to someone, say hello, and then go ahead and take a seat. everyone, welcome to Harbor Point. We are so glad you chose to worship with us this weekend. If you are new to Harbor Point, we want to invite you to our welcome luncheon this Sunday immediately after our last service. You will have the opportunity to meet new people and connect with staff and pastors. We will answer any questions you might have about the church, share our vision, and help you get connected. We're so glad you're here and we are excited to meet you. Fall is such a great time of year here at Harbor Point. It's when we get to set our new rhythms for the season, and we want to help you take your next step in getting connected. All of our groups are beginning to launch their fall sessions. Rooted and Alpha have just begun, and it's not too late for you to jump in. Also, our Women's Ministries has multiple groups and Bible studies that launch this week. From mops to mom life to morning and evening Bible studies, there is something offered for women in every stage of life. And for our men, we have two group options that meet weekly on Tuesday evenings and Thursday mornings. You can find information about all of our groups on our app or website. Just scan the QR code in front of you. Well, thanks so much for being with us today. It's great to be with you as we continue our series, The Why Behind Our Wants. All right, hey everybody, how's it going? Yeah, 10 o'clock people, you, come on, you're awake, you, you had your coffee, you had something to eat, you're like, let's go at 8.30. No, no, forget it, it's raining, it's dark, we can't do that. 10 o'clock, now you're here, you're ready to go. Those of you who are in the tent, glad you're with us. Those of you watching online, I say this every week, the best expression of our church always is the people and being together. And so those of you guys are in here, we're glad you guys made it. I know it's talking to just a couple of, you know, parents coming in. It was like, we made it, but just barely. And you can tell the ride out here might have been a little bit of a challenge, but you made it. Big smiles. We all got here. Way to go. I'm amazed. Some of you, I saw there was a group, I, uh, a, you know, a couple with like three kids and they're all matching and all their hair was like perfect and everything else. And I was like, we were never that. We were never that family. And so if, if people had shoes on, we were like, success. So pants are optional for our kids, but shoes were yes, definitely. Uh, but yeah, glad you guys made it. However you made it here, we're glad you're with us. If you're new, just want to let you know, forewarn you, there's probably a good chance someone you don't know might introduce themselves to you. It's kind of, what, kind of the culture around here. We kind of introduce ourselves and meet people. And our hope is that you find this to be a place you can call home. And here's the deal. If you're wondering, we do not, we do not have all the answers. We don't have everything figured out. What we're all about is we're aiming our lives at Jesus, believing that we were made for that, and we need each other to do it, and everybody has a next step to take along the way. So however it is that you're meeting Jesus, encountering Jesus, not sure about the Bible or everything else, our hope is only that you get to take your next step, whatever that might be. All right, we got a lot to cover. Let's get right to it. Now, I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> think of an experience, if you can. Think of an experience that might cause someone to say this phrase. Ah. Oh. Now, this is, this, is, this is a little bit challenging last service. 8.30, didn't have enough coffee. Okay, I don't mean like, ah, and I don't mean like, ah, like I have an idea. And I don't mean like, ah, oh, that's cute. I mean like something is just so, for you, just, ah, with me? Okay. What's an example? Come on. Morning coffee, yeah. Morning coffee, maybe. I mean, uh, the reason why I say maybe is only because that's like a necessity. It's not like, that's kind of like I have to do this. this every, the day does not function. So it's a, yes, I need it, but it's more like, oh, I can breathe. I can see now, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, for sure, a lot of people it's, ah, oh, but for a lot of other people it's like, I don't know how the world goes around and around in a circle if I don't do this. Okay, good, what else? First day of vacation. No, that's the day you travel. That's horrible. <laughs> Everything about that's terrible. That's terrible. No, no, you had your chance, sir. You had your chance. No, you had your chance. Other folks. What? A hot tub. Yeah, the hot tub. Dude, the first, the first minute where it's a little bit of pain, like, I don't know if I can handle it. Oh, and then it's, you get the jacuzzi chills, which it's like, how is it that I have the chills? It's 100 degrees in here. And oh, it just feels so rad. Yeah, good. What else? When your head hits the pillow at night, just, I don't know whatever else is going to happen in there. Oh, just boom. Like, whatever that is, that's the best. I was standing, and now I'm not, and oh, 
Yeah, good. What else? Church parking. Church parking. <laughs> it's amazing how many people have been saying that, and especially in their emails to me about how much they appreciated it. So yeah, that's for me, it's the emails and the feedback I get about all the cones and everything. I just, I actually read them in the jacuzzi, and that's where I just, it's the best for me. So, <laughs> so some of the swear words I omit, but anyways, the rest of it's great. <clears throat> what else, anybody else? The beach, just the beach, doesn't matter what it is. You could be the beach in a rainstorm, just we're there. Here we are. Yep, there we are at the beach. Yep, the sun is out and everything else is good. Okay, we, yeah, well, you had your turn. One more time, sir. We're, we're in a, okay, now, for me, it could be as simple as standing in front of automatic doors at a department store. You're walking towards Target or something like that. It's hot and the doors open and you get just get a waft of AC on you. It is like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to camp here. They're going to ask me to leave in a little bit, but I'm just going to stay right here and let that air come upon me. Hot chocolate on a cold day after a good dinner, like... You're out somewhere, and then it's like, let's have dessert. And it's like, I don't know if I should. Ooh, they have creme brulee. And then you have one of those, and it's like, oh, that is something, and I'm not sharing with anybody. <laughs> I remember as a kid, one of, my first mom one of my first moments like this, and I don't remember exactly the moment. I just remember having this experience. I'm on the couch. I'm probably watching He-Man on TV because that was the greatest cartoon ever. And then I, I would just I remember the dryer would, the buzzer would go off. Mom would go get a whole like, tub full of dry, hot dryer clothes and just dump them on me. Oh, we didn't have a jacuzzi, but that was the closest we got in my family growing up. Now, implied in all the ah moments is that the, that the moments preceding it are different than the ah. In other words, there's something different in the moments that immediately precede the ah moment. So, you know, being in front, like if you're, you know, cold and you jump into a jacuzzi, not jump in, step in carefully, of course, uh, but if you step into a jacuzzi and then it's like there was something, you're cold, then you get into the hot jacuzzi, you're outside of Target and the door's open and the cold air blasts you, it's so hot, and then all of a sudden it feels so good, or you get that moment of a free, you know, you're cold, or you're standing outside, your hands are cold, and you get a hot chocolate, that feels so great, or you're so exhausted all day, you've been standing all day doing whatever it is that you do, that the world has demanded of you, and you f that, that, that moment is so different than being horizontal on your bed. It's just so good. Now, the circumstances, to say it again, preceding the ah moments are those moments that we go, we wish they could be, or we decide that they need to be changed. And determining what is, what does, and what does not need to be changed in our lives, and what we decide to do about those kinds of things, tell us a lot about the why behind our wants. The things that we deem worthy of change, and the things that we decide to change, and the things we decide we don't need to change these things, tell us actually a lot about the why behind our wants. Now we started a series last week called "The Why Behind Our Wants." And a lot of ways, there's probably a lot of ways to look at this topic and a lot of different dimensions to kind of unpack this. For us, here's how we started and where we'll kind of pick up where we left off. What we said is a lot of what we want, a lot of the reason behind we want, why want anything, behind any of our wants, starts with avoiding a couple of things. One is the fear of like sort of this experience of frustration and failure. It's like, well, there's a lot of sort of us navigating around that that happens. We're trying to avoid any kind of exposure and vulnerability a lot of the time because we know what that means, so we're trying to figure out how to avoid that. We avoid any kind of thing that tells us about our own insignificance. We try to figure out how to deal with that. And lastly, we're trying to figure out how to deal with and avoid the, uh, the whole issue of pain itself. We don't do great at any of these kinds of things, but to kind of look at this, we buy, we build, we want, we try to figure out how to address these things merely as a way to sort of avoid them altogether. And anything that promises to help us avoid these things, we just take them on. And so we start seeking other things. We seek instead of anything that has a, well, I should say this way, anything that's a remedy for our frustration or our sense of failure, we just, if that makes our life a little more convenient, we're after that. Anything that gives us a feeling or a sense of security, we'll chase that. Anything that promises it, doesn't even have to deliver, we just might pay attention to it. Anything that helps us to process our own insignificance that gives to us a sense of our own ego or our own exceptionalism, we're all about that. And when it comes to pain, what we seek is pleasure. We're going to spend a little more time talking about that today. This is how we end up getting stuck, though. We, get at, we end up getting stuck just trying to solve and address these kinds of things. We get invited, enticed, whatever, however you want to describe it, to seek solutions for those other things we're trying to avoid. And we end up getting in a little bit of a cycle. And the Bible describes it like this in Galatians chapter 4. We talked about this last week. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? What's so important to keep in mind, what's being talked about here is this. 
these things that keep us stuck, where we keep kind of going back to them, we're sort of generating our wants, all that kind of stuff, what's being described here isn't that those things are forcibly or coercively trying to create in us a situation, or like directing us to a particular thing or forcing us into a particular thing. The way the Bible describes those things we go back to is as weak and miserable forces. It will use the language of slavery to actually describe them. Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Now, why this matters and why this is so important is this. To summarize this passage, maybe a little bit too succinctly, but let's just put it this way. What's actually being described here is the power over us that these things have, power over us is because of power given to them, to those kinds of things. It's not because they're so powerful that they're oppressing us in a particular sort of thumb on our, you know, thumb on us or, you know, foot on our neck or whatever else you want, whatever analogy you want to use about being forced into anything. All the reason why these things have any power over us is because we give power, we surrender power to them. And this is how we end up getting stuck. Now, the longer we get stuck, the louder this question becomes. The longer we end up in a situation where we're repeating things we didn't want that are driving us to a kind of life we didn't intend to have— Moreover, the more times we do that, the more, the more sort of powerful or louder this question gets. What's wrong with me? Why is it that I keep getting stuck? Why is it that I keep wanting things I didn't really want in the first place? Why do I want these things? And eventually we get to this question, what's wrong with me? How come it's not working out? How come I've done, I've done certain things and it's just not panning out? What's wrong with me? Now, to talk about that, let's just talk about sort of the way to sort of frame this up. The state of things as they are, I'm going, to use, I'm going to use like four Greek words today, and I just don't want you to get any impression that I speak biblical Greek. Like, like I'm conversant in the, like I could have just talked to people in a marketplace in the first century. I know like 40 flashcard words from Greek, so I'm going to use like 10% of them right now. So don't be impressed. You can look these up. In any event, the Greek word for the way things are is this word right here, stasis or stasis, right? This is the idea that it literally means stand and sort of one way to sort of describe it is the way things stand. If, you, if I was to ask you, like, hey, how are things going? Well, the way things stand are stasis. You with me? Now, when we think about the way things are right now, however it is that you approach this idea, what makes up the way things are right now is basically three things, more or less. The way things are right now, one of them is helpful rhythms. Things that you establish, perhaps it's a cup of coffee in the morning, it's that thing that's like, this is a part of the rhythm of my life, of the way things are that I look forward to. It is helpful in so many different aspects of my life. Helpful rhythm. But then we also have sort of settled routines. Neutral things, not bad, not good. They're just things that help. They're just part of our, we just unthinking do these kinds of things. They're just part of what we do. A settled routine. And then lastly, part of the way things are right now, the way things stand, at least at least if we're honest, there's a little portion of us that's also connected to sort of unwanted ruts. Things that we find ourselves doing that we don't want. And what we find is we talk, honestly, it, kind of sort of to be vulnerable about this, or at least to kind of take a next step for our, ourselves in this room, is to say this. Everybody has the same thing. So we can all be a little bit like, okay, we're all in the same place. Because everybody has some place where there are some helpful rhythms, some settled routines, and there's some unwanted ruts in all of us. Now that said... People who get stuck doing the same things, now that's all of us to a certain extent, people who get stuck doing the same things all want the same thing. People who get stuck doing the same things over and over again, unwanted things that they keep doing over and over again, people who get stuck doing the same things all want the same thing. They all want something different. Something to be different. They want to feel different. They want the world to be different. They want something about them. We're stuck doing, I want to change an unhelpful rut. I want to sort of deal with some of these things that have become maybe perhaps only routine. I need something to be different in my life. And being stuck is at a minimum an unpleasant experience. Well, on the other end of the spectrum, if it's, it can be quite unbearable. There can, if there's some sorts of abuse or neglect or whatever else, it's at a minimum it's unpleasant, but at a maximum it's really an unbearable way of being. Now, you would think, that people, when they reach a state of unpleasantness or unbearableness in their lives, that they would be quick to resolve the issue. But people don't resolve the issues that they face. People resolve the way they feel long before they get to the issues that they have to, dre- have to address. People are quick to address their feelings way, way, way before we address the, the, the actual issue that's underlying. And the best way, when we start to feel ourselves in an unhelpful rut, 
to deal with those kinds of things is to find and seek out a moment of awe, a moment of pleasure. If I could just get a little bit of relief, I could move forward, but I just, I don't know, I don't want to deal with all the stuff that's behind it. Things are uncomfortable. If I could just feel a little bit better, everything would work itself out because here's what we live by. Here's what our culture lives by. Here's what we've all been taught. And it's so easy to slip into. All of us have done it before. Because here's what we believe. Feeling better is the same thing as actually being better. As soon as we start feeling better, we're like, everything's great. We're fine now. It doesn't matter that things haven't been really dealt with. We can push those aside. All I have to really deal with is the fact that I feel better now. Now, I just want to make sure I'm clear about a couple things here. Pleasure, like feeling good, is not bad. It's, it's not a bad thing. It, the issue that the Bible will talk about, we'll get to in a second, is that when it becomes a singular focus, the pre predominant sort of occupation of a per person's life that they orbit their life around is just simply finding and seeking pleasure, that's when things get disordered. And maybe that's why the Bible has this to say about it. Now, the word pleasure, this word right here, you might recognize it's sort of, this is the transliteration of the Greek, um, hedonon, you might recognize the word, maybe hedonism if you've ever heard that before. This is where that comes from. And the, literally, the, the word means delightful or sweet. Life or sweet. This is where we get this idea. Now, when we sort of talk about this, Jesus, to give you a sort of a, a, an example of this from the Bible, Jesus tells a story, famous story. He tells a story about a farmer who goes out and he's, he's sowing some seed, planting seeds, and he talks about the seed falling on different kinds of soil. Now, to brief, I'm just not going to do the whole story, but just to give you kind of a snapshot. The seed represents the Word of God. The soil is the conditions of people's hearts to receive God's Word. You with me? Here's the story, and then, I'll, then the disciples, of course, need a little follow-up. I'll give you that as well. Here's what happens. Luke chapter 8. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path that was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. So you're getting the idea. Different kinds of soil, different sort of impact results. Uh, other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. So they grow up, and then all of a sudden they got thorns or weeds. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. So Jesus tells this to a group of people. He's talking about something called the kingdom of God, how it works, the God's word kind of lands in their life, however. Then the disciples are like, wait, 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 explain it to us. Skipping forward to verse 14. Remember, he, he's going to talk about specifically what's in verse 7. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Notice what happens in verse 14. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go along their way, they are choked out by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Now, what's so important to keep in mind here is that Jesus is drawing a connection between people whose, whose lives are preoccupied with pleasures and their lack of maturity. In other words, somehow this obsession or this sort of focus or the ability to kind of continue to go back to these awe moments as preeminent in people's lives robs them of the maturity that they intend, they're intended to have. It stops their growth, is what's being said. Elsewhere in the Bible, pleasures, by the way, that's the word, you know, hedonon, or what we just said before. Elsewhere in the Bible, Proverbs 21, we'll say it this way. Whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Now, what's so important to point out here, this isn't saying whoever has pleasure will become poor, or whoever likes pleasure will become poor. Remember, love is about this sort of idea of orienting our life around a particular kind of thing. That will rob you of the life you're intending to have, is what's being said here. In Proverbs. Now for us, when an ah moment isn't enough for us, we actually look for something bigger than that. We're actually, in some ways, we actually begin to apply, in the Bible, you actually begin to apply spiritual language to, a, to a sort of describe the experience we're actually looking for. So when ah isn't enough, we're actually looking for something else. It's this word right here. Ecstasis. Now that word means out and stand. Now you're like, outstanding, kind of. Let me try to explain. It literally means a change of place. It's like there's something about what's happening here that's a change of place. To say it differently, you might know the, the sort of English rendering of this word, ecstasy. Now there's lots of connotations here that go to all different sorts of places here, and I don't want to exclude those. I'm just not going to talk about all of the different connotations here. I just want you to get the idea that when we use the phrase sort of to be out of place, you might have used it in this phrase, or this sort of ways of, of sort of speaking about it, to be out, uh, to have an out-of-body experience, or to be beside oneself. That's the, the description when the Bible uses this word, ecstasis, it's describing 
an experience of someone who is beside themselves and having a kind of out-of-body experience. And we use it differently than that, which I'll explain in a second. But here's one example. Jesus is he's teaching at one point in someone's house. Again, another famous story. He's teaching in someone's house. Incredible. People are kind of packed in there. They can't get in. A couple of guys bring their buddy on a mat who's paralyzed. They're like, we can't get in. So they go up to the roof, cut a hole in the roof, and drop, drop this guy in front of Jesus. Jesus is like, and another thing about the kingdom of God. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, there's a guy here, and now, oh, sorry, we've been interrupted. And you know, just however they lower him down. I'm not sure how they did that, but they lower this guy in front of Jesus, and Jesus heals this guy. Here's what happens. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he'd been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed. Ecstasis. They're beside themselves. Oh my gosh, this is incredible. And they gave praise to God. The people have a moment, a limited, powerful spiritual experience, and they go, holy smokes, this is what happens. Elsewhere in the Bible, Peter, who's one of the disciples, he has a moment crucial to the early church. And he has this moment, this, he has this experience where God speaks to him in a vision, which happens so often in the Bible, every so often. Here's his experience. Notice the language that's used here. So you have the word amazed here. About noon the following day, this is not like the following day after this moment happened. This is like many years later. <laughs> About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And he fell, uh, he, uh, sorry, and he, while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. That's the way it's translated in this particular version of the Bible. So you have something so amazing that people are beside themselves, or you have in this case, Peter gets a vision, which you could start, sometimes gets called an altered state of consciousness, trance, ecstasis. Now we use the language of ecstasy to describe a kind of thing which is actually different. What we're looking for or what we're describing is actually the language of escape, total departure, total detachment. Totally a different experience. There's a reason, it's no, I should say this way, there's no accident that the, the drug MDMA goes by the street name ecstasy. It is the total detachment of self, something completely different. The attachment artificially to other people around, that's what people who have been on ecstasy will talk about. And we go, for a lot of us, we're like, I'm not looking for an escape. I'm not trying to do that. That's, I get that there's some people that do that. And for a lot of us, we're like, that must be really hard for those people. I'm glad I'm not one of them. Let me just explain. We can find escape in so many other ways. For some of us, it will just simply be going shopping. TJ Maxx, anybody? <laughs> oh, we just, that laughter is a confession. Okay. <laughs> it can be shopping. It can be eating. It can be drinking. It can be any kind of addiction. It can be pornography. It can be all of those kinds of things that just tell us we can be lifted up out of where our experience more than an awe moment and actually escape it. Even an angry outburst is an ecstatic moment of escape. A moment where we say, all the restraints are off. I just get to go, woo, get to do whatever I want. I have been there. I have felt the experience of that release and it's wonderful for about a second and then there's damage and there's apologies that need to be made there's the lose we call it losing it for a reason everybody longs for this kind of escape in some way and we choose it sometimes Surprisingly, even people who are new to faith people who come to Jesus they have a moment where God meets them in a really kind of bigger than life moment and they're transformed. There's like this euphoric experience. It is ecstatic. In fact, I would say probably in some ways at Harbor Point, we probably underemphasize some of the experiences that people have with God that are transcendent and are kind of in that experience. We probably underestimate those kinds of things. But those kinds of experiences, even when we look in the Bible, they're not only and always the experience of people of faith. And for a lot of people who come to faith in Jesus, there's a moment or a season of this kind of experience of everything is amazing and incredible and over the top, and then they lose heart. And sometimes they lose faith, and sometimes they blame themselves as if it was their fault that they're not constantly floating three or four feet above the ground in an ecstatic emotional experience. But ecstatic emotional experiences are a temporary reality. They're not intended to be the way that we live. No one is intended to live only like this all the time. That's an escape. I mean, even if you look at people in the Bible who had some of these moments, these sort of bigger moments like this, people like Abraham or Moses or some of the prophets or even some of the disciples or Paul himself, 
these people didn't live their entire ministry like this or their entire lives like this. They still had to go on and do day-to-day stuff. These things weren't intended to be a permanent reality of our experience of God. They're only intended to be a temporary, a look into something, to be amazed for a moment, to be beside oneself. It's not a forever kind of moment. They're supposed to be temporary. Think for a moment, on the simplest terms. Getting in a jacuzzi, awesome. And after about 15 minutes, it is the most claustrophobic experience of your life. And if you happen to brush up against someone else's leg in the jacuzzi, it's like, oh my gosh, like, how are we bathing together? This is gross. This is, everything's gross. It's all gross. Barf, right? As an adult, think about this. As an adult, think about the last time you tried to drink two hot chocolates back to back. You're like, this is so great. This is so great. And you have a second one. You're like, there are hair on my teeth. There's hair on my teeth. This is not, I don't know what's up with this, but I'm not doing this again have a little bit too much creme brulee to kind of go, I'm only going to eat creme brulee for my life. It's like, nah, I just ate a cactus, and it just really does not feel awesome. And all of us have been in this situation. Some of those moments, those awe moments, which, and even those escape moments, are not intended to be long-term things, and people chase them for the rest of their lives as a matter of avoiding the stuff they have to deal with. But this is why the Bible emphasizes something other than the ecstatic moments. Not to say that they're not there. And probably, like I said, we probably underemphasize some of those things here at our church. But there's something else that the Bible does actually emphasize. Before we get to that, which I'll tell you in a second, I have to kind of set the table for what we're going to do. Now, mature, I have to set this up. Mature people are comfortable with things, I have to describe this. Mature people are comfortable with things like this. They are characterized by having some familiarity or comfort with reality. They've made peace with the way things are. That's a mature person. Okay, this is the way reality is. I'm okay making peace with it. I mean, I like it, but I'm I'm just choosing to accept it. Not only that, mature people are, when appropriate, willing to take responsibility. Some of you take too much, some of you take not enough, but the idea being here, a mature person appropriately takes the responsibility for their own actions in their own life. That's a mature person. And a mature person, when it comes, when it's necessary, will deem that it's, they probably might need to make a change in their life. On the other hand, immature people live their life kind of characterized by a sort of fantasy. It doesn't matter what actually is, it only matters what I want it to be. And when people live in a sort of fantasy universe, they're unwilling to take responsibility. They're really good at avoidance. And not only that, they're good at blame, other things that kind of look like that sort of thing. That's an immature person. And also, when there's a need for change, what the first thing an immature person will do is not look for a change that needs to happen in their life, because change is a process that's hard and tedious. A person who's immature will look for an escape. Now, some of you are like, which one one am I? If you ask your spouse, don't. You're just going to end up with the wrong guy. I just want to tell you right now, they're going to be like, yeah, you wish you were sure. Okay, no, here's the reality, okay? Here's for us, for me. And I look at this list. There are things in my life about which I am like, I'm, yep, I'm a mature person. I'm an adult in the room. And there are some areas in my life where I'm like, I just would rather bury my head in the sand. I'd rather escape things than have to deal with the hard work to change. There is probably in your life, with a great degree of certainty, I will say, some areas in which you are acting like an incredibly mature person, in some cases where we're probably just faking it, doing our best, and there are some areas probably where we're also kind of acting a bit immature. And the reality for a person who is longing to be more mature, not all of you will want this, we cannot escape ourselves. We can't escape ourselves, and there's another dimension of this which is not going to make all of us comfortable. It's not really kind of popular in the world. It's important to recognize this. We can't escape ourselves, and the truth is, even with that, there actually is something wrong with us. There actually is something wrong with us. I know we're not supposed to say that to each other, but there is. People are broken. And people are broken around this one kind of central idea, and it captures a lot. It's a big umbrella, but we're kind of broken under a self-worship at other people's expense. We're the number one thing. The earth, the whole everything should orbit around us. And the condition or inclination to that kind of thing is what the Bible calls sin. So it isn't just the behaviors. It's also the condition of our own lives that makes ourselves kind of worship ourselves at other people's expense. And the Bible points to a need for restoration 
a need for wholeness that we cannot give to ourselves. And so the Bible is far less interested in emphasizing, although it does emphasize this, far less, less interested in emphasizing ecstasis as it is in emphasizing something else called anastasis. That's what the Bible is far more concerned about. This word means up and stand. Ana, up. Stasis meaning stand. To give you an example of what this looks like, I'll show you. Jesus is with a person whose brother has just died. Jesus, they called for Jesus. Supposed to, they're like, hey, our brother's sick. Can you come help us out? And Jesus takes his time. It's a kind of mysterious passage. He takes his time. The brother dies. Jesus goes, his name's Lazarus. Jesus goes to this, this guy's tomb, and he's meeting with his sister. And as Lazarus is, he, not Jesus' sister, he's meeting with Lazarus' sister, and they're having this conversation. And then he hears what happens. Notice the language. Jesus said to her, I am the Anastasis and the light. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. That is what Jesus and the Bible is far more concerned about than escape. It's resurrection. Anastasis, then, is just the word for resurrection in Greek. Probably better said it again. Like, I'm not good at Greek. I think it's actually pronounced anastasis, but... I don't know how to say it that way. I took Spanish. I emphasize it like I'd be Spanish. Anastasis, you know, whatever. Anyway, that's how I, I don't know. I, that's my best. Okay, now, Jesus says, I'm the Anastasis and the life, the resurrection. With different language, the Apostle Paul, not using exactly the same word here, he does elsewhere, but he uses these words. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. Now, What's so important to, cap to capture here is the work that we do about all the stuff that we need to change in our lives isn't just about the hard work that we do. There is a dimension of God's work, His Spirit at work in us to transform us. Some of you are not comfortable with that idea. You're like, I don't mind working hard, but I'm not cool with the spiritual stuff. I just want to tell you, this is what the Bible's talking about. These weak and miserable forces are overcome by God's Spirit at work within us, which is transforming us, and that takes a long time. Stay with me on this. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living from you, Anastasis, raising from the dead. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give, your, give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. In other words, the way to transformation is because of the power of the resurrection, not just for Jesus, like good for Jesus, that happened for him one time at Easter, we celebrate that, and we should have eggs and a bunny or something. I don't know how that goes together, but it did, and whatever that is, we don't know. But nevertheless, we're like, gosh, that's great that he rose from the dead. That's actually happening here is what the Apostle Paul is saying is, that same power that raised him from the dead is available and present in people's lives who have faith in Jesus. That's a big statement. We might meet God in a moment that's kind of an, uh, like a beside ourselves sort of moment, but God transforms us over time, and the work of God's Spirit happens over the long haul every day. That's way harder than just escaping. But that's what the Bible is talking about. It's what the Bible is emphasizing over and over again. And there's another layer to this, too. Brace yourselves, people who long for maturity. Here it is. The way things stand prior to a resurrection sort of moment, the stasis of things before a resurrection, brace yourselves, is that something had to have died. Death is right before resurrection. There is no resurrecting a not dead thing. Check this out, Romans 6. A little bit of language we've got to deal with here. Romans 6, verse 3. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? A couple of words here we've got to unpack here. The word baptism, literally, in the Greek, it literally means to immerse. That's what the word actually means. We might just say simply to place into. So when someone is baptized, they're placed into, the, the, at least the, it's the emblem or the, the sort of symbol, the representation of being placed into Christ. So if you've seen us do baptisms before, someone stands in the water, lays, like kneels in the water, and then we lower them into it, baptized, placed into Jesus. And then, it, but look what it says. Baptized into his death. That's the expression. That we're actually replicating the idea of being buried to something and raised to walk in a new thing. Check this out. We have been, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. There's the symbol. Buried with Christ. And in fact, when I, if I baptize people, I actually summarize this passage. I'll say, buried with Christ in baptism. And I keep them underwater about this long. raised to walk in a new life. In other words, there's certain parts of things that are left behind. 
We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. But check this out, one more step. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in anastasis like his, in a resurrection like his. The whole picture of what Jesus is doing isn't simply to cause us to have an escape from so many things, is that which governs so many of our wants. Instead, is that our life might be a resurrected kind of life. Something that the change that we need starts with letting some things die, calling them what they are, and letting them die. Better said, some things we have let die. There's probably a lot of us that are trying to sort of exhume the body and resuscitate them that we might still go back to some of those things as if they're going to deliver on the promises they couldn't deliver before. Some stuff needs to die. Let me ask you, if you're a person longing for a deeper kind of maturity, a next step, even if you're not there yet, let me ask you what needs to be buried. Maybe it's a thing that you keep wanting. Maybe it's a thing that promises to give you a little moment of awe so you don't have to deal with life the way that it comes at us. The stasis of things isn't good enough. And you're like, if I could just exhume that dead thing that was, I once, I, don't, I didn't do that, but now I'm bringing it back to my life. Or maybe there's a thing that you're still holding on to. It kind of travels around with you and you're just like, I just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep that around a little bit. Maybe there's an invitation to let it die. Now, a guy named Jay Stringer who wrote a book called Unwanted. I heard him talking about his book. It's fascinating stuff. But he just goes, and he uses, he talks about a lot of our unwanted desires point to something in our life that's broken that we ought to look at or whatever else. Really, really brilliant stuff. One of the things he says is if you take all the promises, and some of you guys will catch this reference, take all the promises that every kind of addiction might be, for whether it's food or drugs or alcohol or sex addiction or everything in between, all of those things promise the same thing. They say to us, all these wants we don't want that are dictating all the sort of stuff that we do. They all make the same promise. See if you recognize this reference. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And that's the lie we believe. Because those things keep us trapped. And this is why we keep going back to them, these weak and miserable forces, because they promise to give us rest. And the truth is, for a little bit, there's some payoff. And the truth is, to let some of these things go, it's really hard. And we mourn what we bury, because those things did pay off for us for a little bit. And they were helping us escape some of the pain. And so we went to those things, and there is some kind of payoff. And so we have to mourn those things. They were good for us for a little while. And we hung on to them too long. We got to let them go. We have to bury those things. Is there anything that needs to be buried in your life? You can call it what it is. It doesn't belong there anymore, and you've got to let it go. Is there anything you keep exhuming from the ground and trying to resuscitate? Is it an attitude? Is it a belief? Is it a lie? Is it a habit? Is it a fantasy? Is it a manipulation that you have over someone else? Is it a coldness or a bitterness or a resentment or a self-righteousness or a tiny little permission that you go, yeah, 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 it probably applies to some people, but I get to carve out because, you know, I'm me. Is there anything that needs to be buried in your life? Because we choose our wants more often than not to try to find a way to get a little bit of relief and then try to find an escape. There's one more thing. You get no extra credit by making this a solo mission. Some of you steeled up and went, okay, here we go. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take care of this on my own. And I'm going to come back and say, I did this all on my own. I just want to let you know God's power is at work mysteriously and powerfully through his spirit in us, but also with other people. You were never intended to come to this, this experience alone, wondering if I'm by myself. The whole idea of transformation and getting unstuck is an us thing. Some of you have been trying to do this on your own for so long, and you've never had anybody else reflect back to you what's actually going on. And we need each other. We need each other. We need the vulnerability that says, I'm screwing up or I'm going down this road. And that person might just be the other person that says, you might need to go find a therapist. You might need to do this. You might need some prayer. You might need to go, we might need to have a talk. It might just need to be some truth, but it also might need to be kind of couched in this love and relationship together. That's what we're longing for. 
This is why we put so much emphasis on getting into life groups and being connected and finding your next steps. That may be what the invitation is for you today. Let's pray together and respond together as we sing. Jesus, thank you that you meet us right where we are. Our fear is that there's some part of us that we just simply have to hold on to that you, Father, are not so excited about that we just, man, you must not want us in your presence and yet you call us to you. We're tired, we're exhausted. We're just looking for a little relief from some of the pain of what it is to live the way that we do. Father, we confess those things to you now, whether it's the things that we deal with or the things, the way that we deal with the things we ought to be dealing with. We confess both to you. For some of us, we're just not sure if we can come to you. But you invite us to bring everything, all of it, to bring everything to your feet, Father. And so we do that now, whatever we're up against. Our regrets, our shame, our fear, our sorrows, we bring it to you, to your feet, that you might overwhelm us with your love and goodness and tenderness now, Father. And so we respond to you. Hear us now as we set our prayer to music. In your name, Jesus, amen.
What you just prayed is not, I bring most things to the feet of Jesus. I bring the things I'm comfortable with to the feet of Jesus. It is everything. And while everything else in our lives that sort of makes us, they all make similar promises, come to me and I'll give you rest, only Jesus says. I give you rest and we can trust him in it. So as we conclude, would you hold out your hands and would you just receive those words over you as a blessing? If you're willing to have your hands out, great. If you're not, it's okay. Don't worry about it. But just receive this as a blessing. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Where you are exhausted and overwhelmed, where you are looking for a moment of relief or even an escape, might those words come back to you. Come to me, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. And whatever you face, and whatever you're up against, what triumph or tragedy or challenge that you might face, may the love of the Father and the grace of the Son and the fellowship and comfort of the Holy Spirit be among you all. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen. See you guys next week. Great to be with you guys. Drive safe.